Many ancient cultures share similar beliefs. Fundamental elements that vary slightly from culture to culture. While individual cultures have different stories attached to these elements, the elements themselves are present in cultures all over the world. The Axis Mundi is one of these elements, often depicted as a world tree or a world mountain. The Axis Mundi represents the connection between the different worlds of ancient belief. For the sake of keeping this discussion from becoming overly complicated, I will stick to the model of a world tree. On the world tree, the branches represent the heaven world, where the luminaries play across the sky. It was here that the gods dwelt. The roots of the tree represented the underworld. There were often gods and godlike beings that dwelt here too. If you have been following our work, you will know what we think these gods were. The angels, or accelerators, exist in the underworld. And it's the accelerators that project the luminaries in the heavens. The trunk of the tree represents the part of the world where we live. The tree is said to represent the center of the world. This does not mean that there is a giant tree growing in the exact center of our realm. Shamans who remember, and are most familiar with, these old teachings will tell you quite frankly that the center, or axis mundi, is at the location you find yourself at any given moment. So once again we have a common element in ancient culture passed down to us through allegorical stories. The common misconception about the world tree is that it represents a torus field. The fact that the center is everywhere you could possibly go negates that theory. Also, the symbol of a world mountain does not fit a torus field. So let's take a deeper look into the Axis Mundi. Almost invariably, you find reference to specific animals associated with the world tree. An eagle lives in the top branches. Down amongst the roots, a snake, a serpent, or a dragon resides. The eagle and the snake are mortal enemies, directly opposed to each other. They are constantly at odds. We believe the eagle and the snake to be the two opposite charges of electricity. In many cultures, the eagle is associated with lightning, from the majestic Thunderbird to Zeus, who would turn into an eagle and cast lightning down at his enemies. The eagle is strongly associated with atmospheric phenomena. We also know that the layer of the sky known as the ionosphere carries a very high electrical charge. The Earth's electrical field is ever-present. On average, the field has 100 volts per meter of altitude with highest voltage at the upper levels. The snake, or dragon, resides in the underworld. It represents the opposite electrical charge. We are very familiar with lightning strikes descending from the clouds to strike the ground. But, there are also positive lightning bolts that travel upwards from ground to sky, as above, so below, to opposing electrical charges in an ever-present static electrical field. There is sometimes mention of a third animal that dwells on the tree. In the Norse version, this is the squirrel named Ratatoskar. This mischievous little troublemaker spends his time delivering insults between the eagle and the snake. In doing so, he keeps the rivalry going. Walter Russell taught that the two opposing forces of electricity are kept separate by what we know as magnetism. Magnetism balances and controls the equality of the two opposed electric charges. Now that we have a better understanding of the allegorical components of the world tree, we can decode it. The Axis Mundi is wherever you happen to be. This means that wherever you go, the forces of electricity and magnetism will have the same general effect on you. We live in a static electromagnetic field. 
And while there are slight differences in the field at different locations, the physical effects of that field are constant. Whether you see matter as particles or wave functions, we can still discuss the electrical components within matter without arguing over the much. All matter is composed of these electric charges. Matter will gravitate to the point in the electromagnetic field which is consistent with its electrical potential. What we call gravitation is a function of the electrical component of the electromagnetic field. We can then define gravitation as the repelling force from the opposite electric charge. Not everything is repelled downward as we commonly think when we discuss gravitation. Indeed, some matter is repelled upwards, such as is the case for helium. All matter is being pushed into the area of the field where it has like electrical potential. Walter Russell spoke of gravitation as a function of electrical potential. I highly recommend his books. There is further evidence found in creation stories. The ancients spoke of an original deity. This deity is often told to have had two offspring. One was the embodiment of the sky, the other embodied the earth. The world tree was planted to separate the two. This is consistent with Walter Russell's ideas of a universal one. A single consciousness that first split itself into the two opposing electrical forces which govern all things. This can be seen as one of the cubes Walter spoke of. One half of the cube is positively charged, the other half negatively charged. It is in this cube that our realm would exist, with the surface plane of the earth being parallel with the magnetic plane that divides the two equally opposed electrical forces. Essentially, we live inside a giant capacitor where everything we know of acts as the dielectric, including ourselves. A capacitor consists of two plates. One plate carries a positive charge and the other has a negative charge. Locally, one of the two plates consists of what we know of as the ionosphere. It's possible the large star halos have a role to play in that in some fashion, but the star halos are inside the electrical field as well, so that can only be speculated for now. The bottom plate is below us somewhere. We don't know its exact location, but we know it must carry the opposite electric charge as the ionosphere. It's possible the angel accelerators, in conjunction with the large star halos, influences the field to make our experience of gravitation different from whatever lands exist, if any do, outside of our realm. Everything between these two plates acts as a dielectric. The particles of a dielectric within an electric field will align themselves to conform to the direction of the electric force inside that field. In Earth's case, we and everything else here act as those particles. The dielectric is not one solid chunk. We are a dynamic system of varying density and physical state. This gives everything a certain room to move, and the various parts will be inclined to find the area of electrical potential that align with their inherent charge. The denser matter is forced down, while the lighter matter is forced upwards. Within the static electrical field, everything that we call matter creates a sort of whirlpool in the field. We call these whirlpools torus fields. They are the result of compression and expansion forces from the electrical field itself. The mythos of the world tree is a beautiful allegory and describes the fundamental forces that govern our realm. Whether our realm is the extent of existence or not is debatable. Only time and exploration will tell.